Today, I'm going to preach on the lectionary reading that you heard read earlier from Psalm 1. But first, it's Father's Day, and to celebrate, there's delicious root beer floats in the Solid Rock Lodge with the good stuff, Sprecher's root beer, and all are invited to have a root beer float on this very hot day today. Here's my father, David. I keep this photo in my office. In the warmer months, he lives in Colorado, where I grew up. He winters in Scottsdale, Arizona. I see him about once or twice a year. I visited him in Arizona in February, and we played some golf. We also watched some golf. We went to the Phoenix Open, and we walked his pug, Abby, together. Lots and lots of walks. Dads are important, aren't they? Here we are in February. My dad taught me how to hustle in sports, how to play golf. We did puzzle races together. Who could finish the puzzle the fastest? He taught me how to drive a car, and he followed me all the way to Nebraska, where he dropped me off for college. And there he told me, I love you. When we talk on the phone, I end every phone call with, I love you, Dad. He says, I love you too. I'm a proud father of four children. We went strawberry picking on Friday at Tom's in Huntley to celebrate Father's Day. It's one of my favorite activities of the whole year. I want to say a word to dads. Your heavenly father loves you, and he wants to be involved in a positive way in your life. He provides our daily bread. He guides us how to live from his word, and he feeds our faith. And most of all, he sent his son Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and to come back from the dead for us. So dads, I want to tell you that God loves you. And here's a message for fathers, inspired by our heavenly father. Dads and granddads, let's be present, let's be involved, and let's positively influence our children. Yesterday was the 17th anniversary of my ordination. Here's a photo from my ordination. I want to tell you, church, that I love being your pastor. Ministry is very difficult, and I'm thankful to serve the Lord with you. God is on the move here at Lord of Life. The high school mission trip team just returned yesterday, and they went to the Ark encounter. Here's a picture of the team just outside the ark, and this one inside the ark, at the door of the ark. Look how big that door is. Then in the Creation Museum, with dinosaurs, they learned how God created the world and holds it all together today. And then this one in Cincinnati, where they served the community. A big thanks to the adult chaperones who served God on that trip. God is good. Can I get an amen? Amen. So now to Psalm 1. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible and one that I memorized when I was a boy. One that you should also memorize. God lays out a fork in the road. A faithful life blessed by God and then a life that indulges in evil. God's way of trust and obedience and the way of rebellion and destruction. At the end, there's an unspoken question. Which one will you choose? Which way will you go? One leads to life, and the other one leads to death. When I was growing up, there were popular children's books called Choose Your Own Adventure. Anyone ever remember these books, Choose Your Own Adventure? Yeah, they were a fun read. They're fictional and you choose which direction to take, not knowing how it will end up. But in this psalm, it's about real life. And the author David tells us where the good path and the evil path end up. You choose eternal life with God, or you choose death and destruction with the world. So let's get right into it. The very first word is blessed. 
raise your hand if you want to live a blessed life. That's all of us. The author gets our attention right away because we all want to live a blessed life. So what is a blessed life? The word bless and blessing is tossed around a lot today. God bless you. God bless America. We say it when people sneeze. What does bless mean? Bless is a major theme in the Psalms. And the Hebrew word bless is written 64 times in 150 Psalms. And it means to add life. There are physical and spiritual blessings. When Christ fed food to 5,000 people, he blessed them. He added to their life. When Christ healed people, he blessed them, and he added life. A good friend is a blessing from the Lord. I prayed, and God blessed me with an amazing wife. God added life to my life, and my life is better because of her. And most of all, God blesses us when he adds to our lives his son, Jesus Christ, who is the greatest blessing. And from him come one blessing after another. Forgiveness, hope, eternal life, wisdom, faith, joy, and the church. John 1.16 from his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. And here's a very important part about blessing. Blessing is given so that it goes beyond you and it blesses others. You're blessed to be a blessing. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing to the nations. And this is why simply being rich isn't a blessing. There are people who are rich who don't bless others, and their selfishness and their wealth is a curse, not a blessing. Their greed leads to death. Blessings backfire when we hoard them for ourselves. Blessing is closely tied to the Hebrew word life. The word life in Hebrew means movement. Physical life has the imagery of blood flowing through our veins. So blessing means adding life, adding movement. And in a spiritual sense, Jesus adds movement to our lives. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And interesting that the opposite of bless is curse, and curse and death means to step away from movement. It means to stop. When God cursed Adam and Eve, he stopped their access to the tree of life. He isolated them from the garden of Eden. They could no longer eat from the tree. So the blessing stopped and death entered the world. Listen now to how the psalm starts and notice the progression of the movement stopping. Look at this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. So in this, the person is walking, and the movement begins to slow. And then it stops. As this person is influenced by evil, walking in the counsel of the wicked. And what's this look like today? Well, if there's a history of alcohol abuse, the blessed man knows not to walk in drunkenness. A little drink of alcohol can turn into drunkenness and derail a new life of sobriety. The blessed man knows a little view on the computer of something inappropriate easily turns into addiction. And a little gossip about our neighbor or our coworker can break trust. So don't even dabble in evil. Don't walk in its ways. It leads to death. At the end of Psalm 1, the person cannot even stand up in the judgment. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. 
The psalm describes the wicked as chaff that blows away in the wind. If there's something that causes you to stumble, even a little, you're better off without it. Get rid of it. And if there's a friend who tempts you to sin, you're better off without that friend. Or you might find yourself standing with sinners, or even worse, sitting with mockers, completely indulging in it. When we went strawberry picking on Friday, we asked a family to take a picture of us. And when we were finished, and she handed me the camera, I looked, and her baby boy was sitting in the field indulging in strawberries all over his face. And I said, wow, he loves strawberries. It was all over him. And I found this photo of a baby sitting down indulging in ice cream. Root beer floats and ice cream are good, but sin is not. The goal for us is to identify sin early, to repent, and to ask for forgiveness, and to turn away from the sin, that we don't get trapped by the devil's schemes that lead to death. One of my seminary professors once gave an excellent illustration of this during class, and I've shared it with you before, but it's worth repeating. It's one that I really like and helps me understand how the devil works. He compared the devil to a dog chained to a dog house. Chained because he's defeated by Christ. But the devil doesn't act defeated, so he barks really loud to make people scared as they walk by his dog house. The righteous walk right by that dog house right by the barking, and they keep walking. They recognize the evil and the temptation, and they pray, and they delight in God's word, and they keep walking by. That same chained dog is so crafty that he turns into different forms. He goes into his doghouse. He turns himself into a beautiful woman to seduce a wayward husband into adultery and to be devoured. Or he turns himself into an angel of light to deceive people, to follow a false religion, and to turn from the one true God. Or he turns himself into a glistening serpent to tempt Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden. He's crafty, very crafty, So Psalm 1 is a warning. Beware. But we're safe if we just walk by that doghouse because the devil is chained. He's defeated. And as long as we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, he can't reach us. Blessed is the man whose eyes and heart are fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what it means to live in the victory of Christ. And the practical way that the author tells us to do this is in verse 2. But his delight is in the what? In the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. The word of the Lord is a light to our path. It's the standard for right living. And it shows where to go and what to avoid so that we're blessed. Too many Christians today are biblically illiterate. Many don't have a Bible. And many who have a Bible... Don't read it. A preacher I admire once said that there are two things people are looking for in a sermon. What do you want me to know, and what do you want me to do? So I'm going to answer those two questions. 
I want you to read the Bible and to do what it says. I have here with me a Bible, and it's leather bound. It's a great Bible. And I want to give it away today. If you don't have one, come see me after service. Your excuse can't be, I don't have a Bible. If you have one, blow off the dust from the cover and then open it. And it's full of God's blessings for your life. Note that the author doesn't want you to just read it, but to delight in it. Think of the food you delight in. Most recently, I've been delighting in Oreo milkshakes. Anyone here like Oreo milkshakes? Lately, it's been about one a day at home. See, you'll be blessed if you delight in the word as you would an Oreo milkshake. That means receive it, what it says, and apply it to your life. I asked a member of our church recently, is there anything I can do for you? He looked at me and he said, hold me accountable to read the Bible. And it's not just him. It's all of us. What's happening is that people are putting other content above the Bible. God wants that in reverse order. He wants the Bible on top. So do you have a Bible? I have one on my phone. And I invite you to down one load on your phone, too. Here's the one I use, Logos Deep Bible Study app. And you can download it for free from the App Store. And it looks like this when you're actually in the app. There are many translations to choose from. Again, it's all free. There's some purchases inside the app to get even more resources. So I invite you, church, to find one that you like. There are many Bible apps out there. We know how many people are on their phone a lot, right? So we need to keep the word of God close, even when we don't have the paper copy nearby. Sometimes I just need to hear a word from the Lord, and I don't have the paper copy with me. So I'll open it up and read it. And notice how frequent this person is to dwell on the word. Would you say the underlined part with me? And on his law, he meditates day and night. So here's an example of just how important this is. You've heard of Joshua. Joshua led God's people into the promised land after Moses died. If you've ever stepped into Phil's shoes of a great and admired leader, you know how difficult it can be. Expectations are sky high for you to continue to lead excellently. So God spoke these words to Joshua. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And what would give Joshua the wisdom, the strength, the determination, and the power to lead these grumbling, stumbling, complaining people into the promised land? God's living word, his power, and God's living word is power for life. And Joshua successfully led two million people into the promised land. His life produced great fruit for the people of Israel, and they were blessed. So this is really important. Look at this, church. Others are blessed when the word of God blesses you. When the Bible is a top priority in your life, when you're in the word and you delight in it and do what it says, you become a tree planted by streams of water. 
which yields its fruit in season. Everything he does prospers, is what the psalm says. But not so the wicked. Verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. So your wisdom that you learn from the word of God, it's passed down to other people as they see the way you live. Your joy in the Lord, it's contagious because people see it in you. And your love for God is infectious because they see the love of God in you. That's fruit. And it's passed down to others. How about this one? The forgiveness in your heart that they see in you will help them to forgive others. Jesus is this living water here, and his word flows through your life. Movement, right? That's what blessing is. It's movement, and Jesus is moving through your life. When Jesus met with this Samaritan woman at the well, he said, if you knew who it was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Who is the living water? It's Jesus. Living water moves. And without water, things dry up, and there's death. We need water, and we need movement, and we need Jesus. So back to the fork in the road, the unspoken question, which path will you choose? The way of life, the way of the Lord, or the way of the world and the way of destruction? Let's choose the path of life. And notice this promise at the end, at the very end of the psalm. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand on this very hot, hot day today. The Lord loves you, and he's with you. Let's pray together. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord God, thank you so much for Jesus, the living water. And Lord, we admit that there's times when we feel parched, when we feel tempted, when we feel like we're distant from you, Lord. But thank you, God, for drawing near to us. Thank you, God, for blessing us, especially through your son, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we would follow these words from Psalm 1, that we would delight in your word, that it would take deep root in our hearts, and that we would produce fruit for the Lord. So God, thank you again for being our Heavenly Father, who cares for us and provides for us, and who takes care of our needs. We love you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing to the Lord Jesus? Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me. Oh,
just a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. God would build our life upon him. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken away. Please be seated for prayer. Good morning. I'm Bob Kessler, one of the seven elders here. And uh, to all the fathers who are sons of the Father God, I'd like to wish you all a happy Father's Day. Let us pray. Lord, we know that you are our Father tender and compassionate, and we know that your love remains with us forever. We give thanks for the Father who leads his family in ways that reflect your everlasting love. We give thanks to our fathers and pray that you will empower them to remain strong in faith and leadership. Proverbs 23 tells us, for the father of a righteous man has great joy, and he who has a wise son delights in him. Jesus, we lift up prayers for uh, some missions this morning. We have Lutheran Bible translators with us, uh, a long-standing one that has uh, had a, a great impact on, uh, on spreading your word. And Lord, we also lift up prayers for our two missions of the month, uh, Faith Life Ministries, which was founded by former members Barry Voss and Kim Star Voss as a ministry to train and equip Christian leaders in the mission field, and also administer justice ministry, which is a Christian legal aid service that provides guidance for those who cannot afford an attorney. We pray that these ministries will fulfill the needs of the Christian community in ways that serve you and please you, Lord. We pray that you would bless the word of these two ministries as they thrive while proclaiming your good news. 
And Heavenly Father, we pray for your mercies as we do battle with our earthly hardships of health, finances, relationships, and other difficult challenges. May we be filled with a spirit of understanding, and if it be your will, that you would provide complete healing for our maladies. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us recall the words found in Proverbs 3 and pray over them. Fathers, may we constantly remember Father God's teachings and keep his commands in our hearts, for they will prolong our lives while bringing us peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave us or our families. We will trust in you with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, we will submit to you and you will straighten our paths. We are not wise in our own eyes, in our own ways. We will fear the Lord and shun evil. We will honor the Lord with our wealth, with the first fruits of our earnings, knowing you will bless our homes and families with abundance. Fathers, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father disciplines the sons and daughters that he delights in. As fathers, mothers, sons and daughters, and family, we pray that the Holy Spirit will fill our hearts with the love you give to us so freely. And we especially give thanks to our fathers here and in the heavenly realm on this special day. Father God, we lift up all these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'll be in the back uh, for any special prayers that you may have. Thank you.